The wild brings randomness into our lives. It creates situations that are harmful to some and helpful to others. Some people want to rewild our world, but the question for us isn't whether we should try to bring the wild to our doorsteps. The question is how will we respond when the wild shows up and knocks on our door, and when it kicks the door off its hinges? I'm your host Jason, and you're listening to the Esoteric Book Club. Welcome back, goblins! Before we get started, I have a brief announcement. Two of you have risen beyond the rank of mere goblin. One has achieved the status of loyal goblin by contributing to the Esoteric Book Club on Patreon. The other, Samantha Shaver, has ascended to the level of Elemental through her contributions through Patreon. With her new rank, Samantha has access to my articles and writings, access to voting on what book I cover next, and more importantly, she is immortalized by name on every show. If you too want to rise beyond the level of mere goblin, you too can contribute to the show and achieve the titles of Loyal Goblin, Cryptid, Alien Invader, or, as Samantha did, Elemental. As always, links will be provided in the show notes. Now, let's get started. Most books on paganism are either survey books that outline the different types of paganism, or they are hyper-focused tomes on a specific type. What these books don't provide is a foundation upon which all paganism is based. What is the essence at the very core of pagan practices? Where does one begin on their path? John Beckett, Druid, an ordained Unitarian Universalist, has an answer to that question with his book, The Path of Paganism. John Beckett grew up in rural Tennessee with the woods right outside his back door. He may not have realized it at the time, but his time in these woods would shape his beliefs and, in fact, his very future. Now living in Texas, John is an engineer by trade and a pagan priest in his off time. He is a druid with the Order of Bards, Ovates, and Druids, as well as with the ADF, whose name is in Gaelic and I will not attempt to pronounce it and raise the ire of any listeners who actually know how to speak the language. He also spent many years in various roles with the Covenant of Unitarian Universalist Pagans, or CUFS, with two U's, for short. His blog, Under the Ancient Oaks, is a massive tome of knowledge and musings on various pagan topics and can be found on one of my favorite websites, patheos.com. Since the onset of COVID, he has also been broadcasting rituals on YouTube so pagans around the world can still maintain some sense of normalcy. Beckett's first book is the subject of today's episode. Published in 2017, I was immediately drawn to John's writing style. It's conversational, with thoughts flowing easily among various subjects within a core topic. I had found this book, somehow, through Google Books, which allowed me to preview a random chapter. At that stage of my life, I was reeling from a major loss and suffering through severe bouts of depression. Counseling had not helped much, and I was temporarily placed on medication for what was diagnosed as situational PTSD. What I found within the pages of this book helped to draw me, slowly, out of my rather dark headspace and rekindle the joy I had for the natural world. I've mentioned before that I grew up in rural West Virginia, and I spent much of my childhood in the woods myself, so John's words reminded me of a time when I was still filled with that same sense of wonder. Even rereading the book in preparation for this episode, I felt that same reinvigoration of spirit and desire to return to the wilds. I think that is the core strength of this book. It's not just an introduction to a spiritual practice, but it creates that same excitement each time you read it. Rereading it, you'll find tidbits of information that you may not have understood the first time, or, possibly, you simply can see it through different eyes after pursuing your own practices. This book doesn't necessarily create the foundation for paganism, but it certainly does an excellent job revealing it to you. 
So what are the foundational aspects of paganism? According to the author, there are four. Nature, community, deity, and the self. Metaphorically, Beckett alludes to these four aspects as being the tent poles that hold up the big tent of paganism as a whole. A person could be part of one or multiple aspects. In fact, there's quite a bit of overlap between and among them. It's the details that make each of them unique. Nature-centered paganism is generally known by the epithets such as tree-hugger, dirt-worshipper, or even just hippie. The ideal is a reverence for nature and an understanding that we are a part of nature, rather than being apart from it. While they never really called themselves pagan specifically, you can see this reverence in the works of Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, and John Muir. What is interesting is how well this type of paganism meshes with science. The observation and understanding of natural processes can be transcendental for nature-centered paganism. The biggest challenge for this group is increased industrialization and urbanization. Out of necessity, people must go where the jobs are, and this usually means migration closer to cities, thus farther from nature. To remedy this disconnect, Beckett suggests potted plants, pets, and meditation to help re-establish this connection. While it's not a perfect solution, it will help alleviate the disconnect you feel between times when you can be outside. Community-based paganism includes ancestral worship, household spirits, land spirits, as well as the traditional concepts of community. This type of paganism is centered around your group and where they live. This can easily overlap with nature-based, but with a much more narrow focus. It's not about the forest, in a broad-spectrum, intangible way, but more about your forest. Especially now, the need for community is becoming even more essential. Quarantine and remote work is making human interaction less personal. Even before COVID, one aspect lamented by pagans who left Christianity is the lack of a sense of community. Many pagans feel isolated because they are constantly facing ostracism and ridicule from more fundamentalist people in society. Additionally, paganism seems to attract those who already felt like outsiders, giving them a place to find reassurance, even if it is in their own beliefs. The trick is, finding a, quote, pagan community isn't always easy. Pagan is a blanket term, or a big tent term as Beckett phrases it, and incorporates various belief systems. That's what makes this sphere of paganism so tricky to navigate. While you may be interested in group work, it may be the group dynamics that make this difficult. Self-based paganism sounds egotistical, but it's more about being the best you that you can be. It is largely about observation and discernment, but also about absorbing mythology for the lessons it can teach us. By reading them as parables and searching for the underlying meaning, we can find the truth of the world and better filter out the spiritual noise generated by society. This type of work requires discipline and a drive to become a paragon in both thought and action for your chosen path. This doesn't mean that you have to live a monastic lifestyle. It just means you'll be spending a good bit of time inside of libraries, and, more often than not, inside your own head. Deity-based paganism is pretty self-explanatory. That said, there is a good deal of ongoing work necessary for this path. It takes a lot of research and constant, dedicated effort. You are forging a relationship with an otherworldly entity. How would you feel if someone knocked on your door, knew your name, and asked you for help finding a job? It would come across rather off-putting, right? Instead, how would you react if someone knocked on your door, introduced themselves as having recently moved to the neighborhood, and they wanted to drop off a basket of baked goods as a means of saying hello? That's far less creepy. You may invite them in for coffee, or, if you're busy, get their contact info and make plans for future meetups. While I don't specifically recommend baking cookies as a means of introducing yourself to the Morrigan, the idea is the same. Learn about them, build a relationship with them, and together you will both grow. 
Because you are learning from experience, which is called gnosis when growth is made on a personal, spiritual level, this path will direct you towards being a guide or leader for others who seek to worship and work with deities. It's easy to see how this would overlap with community-based paganism. Beckett describes all four of these paths as the tent poles that hold up the big circus tent of paganism. Obviously, the closer you stand to one tent pole, the farther away you are from the others. That's where you would find self-based pagans living a monastic lifestyle, or nature-based pagans growing an heirloom self-sufficient garden in their backyard. Conversely, you can step away from one tent pole to be closer to another. This is like the example I gave earlier, where deity-based pagans would work as community leaders, crossing over into community-based paganism. If you so choose, you can even step outside the tent and be pagan adjacent. This is the area currently occupied by Christian witches and polytheists who don't identify with the label pagan. They may not be under the tent, but they are still at the same circus as us. The next few chapters go into more depth for nature and the gods. The chapter on nature takes a look at how the planet doesn't need saving from humans, because, frankly, it will be fine if we make our environment too toxic for habitation. As Ian Malcolm so succinctly phrased it in Jurassic Park, life will find a way. That life just may not include us. The idea of environmentalism is about finding a means to live in balance with our surroundings in a way that provides for humanity without doing so at the expense of everything else around us. We also have to consider the sheer hubris of attempting to control nature. Every time we think we've mastered our surroundings, a tornado, earthquake, flood, or other natural disaster shows up just to remind us that we are not the ones in charge. In fact, events such as this should be a slap in the face reminder that we too are at the mercy of Mother Nature. It's easy to become complacent from within our air conditioned cubicle office spaces and climate controlled modular homes. While these luxuries make life a bit more comfortable, they are but a thin barrier erected between us and the howling wild. When the beasts of the night come prowling around our door, who do we turn to? Humanity's relationship with the gods is seemingly as old as civilization itself. During the full span of human existence, we have made pleas, offerings, sacrifices, oaths, and curses. Our stories tell of deities intervening in major events, siring heroes, creating monsters, and sometimes vexing mankind. But what do we know of the gods? What can we know? How do we know who or what is even talking to us when we can't see them? These are philosophical questions that have been asked since the formation of religion itself, and it is the primary focus of the chapter on deities. You see, it's not as simple as picking a deity and asking them for favors. They may not listen, or they may otherwise be preoccupied. It may not be what you asked for, but how you asked for it. Sometimes, you're not the one doing the seeking nor the questing. Sometimes, the gods come looking for you. Over the past few years, the practice of ancestor worship has gained significant footing. This practice incorporates a broad span of time and people, ranging from recently deceased to multi-generational family members. Beyond family, this type of veneration also includes spiritual and cultural ancestors. Think of it like President's Day, but more frequently celebrated, and with far fewer parades. With this type of paganism comes more awareness of the past, and more opportunities for reflection on the actions of our forebearers. We would not be here if it were not for them, but that doesn't necessarily mean they were good people. In these instances, what is the best way to approach this aspect of worship? Beckett uses a dualistic approach. Acknowledge the beneficial things they accomplished, but recognize that they were a product of their time and upbringing. That certainly does not mean we should ignore the harm they may have caused, especially if the harm was done directly to the practitioner. First and foremost, you must heal from any trauma the person may have caused. 
even then, you are not required to acknowledge them in any way, shape, or form. Another aspect that people have become more aware of in recent years is cultural appropriation. Paganism embraces different practices from around the world. The gods we worship may have originated in countries that we no longer reside in, especially if you live in the Americas. Beckett has three rules when dealing with cultural practices. Credit your sources, don't pretend to be something you're not, and steal from the best. Before anyone gets triggered, that last one is tongue-in-cheek. Why is it important to cite your sources? If you are dealing with a cultural tradition that you were not raised within, you must give credit to those who were, and do your best to represent it with honor and respect. Did you learn from a book or from a person? If you learned it in a book, where did the author get their information? If you learned it from an individual, where did they learn it? It may seem a bit paranoid, but you have to question everything. Only through diligence can we be certain of our sources, but don't be inflexible. Things change, grow, and adapt. The oldest sources aren't necessarily the most authentic. They were simply a product of their time and culture. Outside of that context, certain elements may no longer make sense. That said, strive for authenticity and respectful representation in your practices. I'll use myself as an example. I studied the Eastern Woodland Native American tribes throughout undergrad and graduate school. I devoured every first-hand account that I could find, and then began to learn modern practices from elders in my immediate area. Am I Native American? As far as I can tell, no. Though a series of courthouse fires in the early 1800s has made portions of my genealogy just short of impossible to trace. For a period of time, if you had a property dispute that was not in your favor, you just burnt down the courthouse where the records were stored and all the property boundaries had to be redrawn. Unfortunately, this also destroyed birth and death records, but I digress. Do I have enough knowledge and experience to lead a ceremony? Maybe. At least, on a superficial level. The most that I am willing to do is to perform a proper blessing ceremony. And even then, it is very basic. It is the same process that you see done at powwows for anyone entering the dance circle. I do not claim tribal heritage, and I clearly state what I am doing when I perform the ceremony. I let participants know what I am doing, why it's being done, where and who I learned it from, and finally, I do not accept money for these services. It is a means to share a practice that I was taught and, in my lessons, was instructed to properly and respectfully share it with others. Much like what I just shared, the next chapter is as much anecdote as instructional, but it works because what Beckett relates will largely ring true to anyone living in a Western country. It begins with a controversial statement. For all our mainstream society professes to be Christian, a casual look shows that what it values most is not the teachings of Jesus, but the accumulation of things. We've all heard the term weekend warriors people who work Monday through Friday and then pack as much activity into Saturday and Sunday as possible. There is also the weekend parishioner, or maybe Sunday spiritualist for better alliteration. These people simply attend services one day a week, but spend the remaining six days ignoring the tenets of their chosen religion. Generally, these are the people who question pagan beliefs for the sole purpose of attempting to bully you into converting to their side. Dealing with judgment and ridicule is one of the most difficult aspects of paganism. One solution, and often the most effective, is to simply not engage. It's hard to harangue someone if they remove themselves from the situation, right? Beckett offers a few ideas if you decide to embroil yourself in that debate but I'll leave those for you to discover when you read the book. What I found most helpful, and most unique, 
was a discussion of how existing in a society, such as America, affects the individual. While it may not have begun as such, America has become a very conservative, fundamentalist society. We are constantly exposed to, quote, Christian ideals, primarily evangelist and Protestant, with hyper-regressive and often exclusionary views in our everyday life. Because it is so ingrained in our culture, it consistently repeats and reinforces fears and doubts. Beckett himself recounts how tormented he was early on in his spiritual quest. He says, My inner fundamentalist was still there, still whispering that it was all a lie of the devil. I showed him the evidence that I had found. He ignored it and kept whispering, What if you're wrong? I don't know about anyone else, but this account rang soundly true for me. Beckett says that voice, the voice of doubt from a religion that he had already abandoned, continued up until the day that he formally embraced paganism, more specifically polytheism. Hearing a first-hand account from someone going through a spiritual crisis as they went through it, because his accounts are truncated versions of his own journals at the time, it is a powerful and reassuring thing. It shows that the same thoughts and doubts that are going through your mind during a similar process are normal societal pressures and can be overcome. His final lesson in this chapter is as follows. Show people what you are, not what you are not. So often a spiritual debate centers around defining who you are in terms of other belief systems. Instead of telling people what parts of their system you don't believe in, show them what the principles of your beliefs are. The best way to counteract someone ranting about your final destination is to prove them wrong by living a virtuous life. This is a principle that has been lost to so many people of faith. You have to live your ideals. It's easy to speak the words of your gods, but it's another thing entirely to live them. What you say is important, but what you actually do is more so. And this is all just the first half of the book. It's an understatement to say that I like this book. I recommend it to everyone I know who is even remotely curious about paganism, polytheism, or earth-based beliefs. Honestly, it's even a great book for a Christian to read because many of the lessons within would apply to their practice as well. At $20, this book is phenomenal. You will get a lot out of it each time you read it. Yes, you are likely to reread this book. Several times. It's that good. You will find more and more nuance to Beckett's words because each time you reread it, you will be at a different stage of your own journey. To me, the most important aspect of this book is how it reinvigorates you. If you ever feel like you have reached a plateau in your magic, your spirituality, or your beliefs, rereading this book will help you see things differently. So whether you grab the digital version or the dead tree version, be sure to get a copy of The Path of Paganism by John Beckett. That's all I have for tonight. As always, links to the books are posted in the show notes. If you like the Esoteric Book Club, please like, share, and review. Esoteric Book Club is now on Patreon. If you'd like to contribute, please leave a donation. There are several different tiers with various rewards, such as voting rights and exclusive articles, with a few other ideas in the works as well. Even at the lowest tier, you're not just a goblin anymore. You're a loyal goblin. Esoteric Book Club can be found on Facebook, Instagram, and at esotericbookclub.org. Intro and outro music is courtesy of Sarah Rudy and her band Hello June. Their music can be found at bandcamp.com and at wearehellojune.com. Until next time, remember, stay safe and stay weird. <laughs>